Okay, hi everyone and welcome back to what's the last session of the, um, the first Transcribers User Conference. So thanks everyone for coming and for making it to the end. So the last session is a panel discussion um, and we're thinking about building on some of the talks we've been having over the past couple of days and how we can continue the collaborations we've um, been making with you all um, into the future. So on the panel today we have... Um, four um, speakers. Three of them are from the READ project and then we have one person who's representing the user perspective of a transcribers user. So I'm going to introduce them briefly but they're mainly going to introduce themselves and I've asked them all to start off by talking just for a couple of minutes about what their role is on the project, how they use transcribers or READ project technology, why it's important in their work and I've also asked them the question of where do they see transcribers in five years' time. Um, so on the panel we have, first of all, Roger Laban um, from University of Rostock, um, Philip Schofield from University College London, Melissa Terrace from the University of Edinburgh, and Debbie Cornell from William & Mary Libraries. So we'll start off with their introductions. Um, let's start with Debbie, if that's okay. Debbie Cornell, Oops. William & Mary Libraries. Um, Let's see. Well, obviously, I gave a presentation this morning so you kind of understand how we're using it. Um, I think I've gained enough information here to, to go back and kind of explore more with the tabular data issues here. So that's great. And the text to image um, work. Um, we're looking to really explore more of the complex um, relationships on the material we're having to transcribe, but I guess in five years' time, I'm hoping more of that um, capabilities of transcribers is built within the tool instead of kind of having to build it outside the tool because it comes with it. Um, and we're also hoping to build more funding for it and, and bring it more to the U.S. to get used for our projects. Thank you. There. Hi. Um, my name is Melissa Terrace. I am now at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, two weeks ago I was at University College London, so I've just moved. And I've been part of the Transcribe Bentham project since it started. So it was at that first meeting where we decided that we were actually going to do it about 10 years ago. Um, and I've been part of that project since, but I do have a background. My PhD was on image processing and uh, artificial intelligence and handwriting recognition. So I've, I've always had one foot in the computational sciences. My new role is Professor of Digital and Cultural Heritage at the University of Edinburgh. I work with big libraries and archives and museums, and small libraries, archives and museums, uh, on a variety of uh, digital tools and techniques that they can use. And I'm fascinated being part of the transcribers team because they're working on the read project working with um, the Bentham team on what they're doing and um, helping with some of the user issues and the user interface issues but also the link to libraries and archives and the institutional links that we can build up with people and in five years time I'd like to see a whole range of things happening I'd like to see more institutions involved. I'd like to see mechanisms for people to be able to run their mass digitization of manuscripts through this kind of software to be able to make it usable and useful for researchers. But I'm also fascinated by a kind of meta question, which is how this is going to change historical research within five years' time. So if we're changing the parameters of the types of searches and the types of access to documents that people can have from doing it themselves one by one to changing the scale, I will, I will want to think about, about what that means for doing historical research with digital resources. I have questions about the data and about some of the data that's getting fed in, especially uh, image collections but also the transcripts that then get generated and what we can be do, doing to collate these so that other people can have access to them and how this fits in with the open glam movement, so open access to data sets and licensing them in ways that other people can take them. And I see the transcribers as part of this wider movement within libraries and archives into digitization and making their content available and making it accessible for as wide of an audience as possible to do worthwhile historical research. Hello, Philip Schofield. I'm still at the University College of London. <laughs> um, and um, I'm Professor of the History of Legal and Political Thought 
um, in the Faculty of Laws. But, uh, so I'm a historian and um, I'm also general editor of the new edition of the collective works of Jeremy Bentham, so I spend a lot of time doing textual editing. Bentham dates 1748 to 1832. The Bentham project was established in 1959 and uh, <coughs> I've not been there since 1959, but I have been there a long time, since 1984. And, um, there are about 100,000 pages of um, Bentham's manuscripts in the UCL collection and um, another 15, 20,000 in the British Library, those are the two major collections. Um, Bentham himself published 40 or 50 books, pamphlets during his lifetime and would destroy the manuscripts on which um, those books were based. So um, the manuscripts are in addition to the printed text. And to date, we have published 33 volumes in the edition, 12 of correspondence, the rest of Bentham's works. My back of an envelope calculation is that there will be 80 volumes altogether um, in order to complete the edition. So this is a, a major, uh, quite unique, um, well maybe not totally unique, but there is the Marx Engels um, edition which is probably comparable. Um, but um, uh, 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 this is a large arts and humanities project which has a massive amount of material to transcribe. We worked out that at the rate we were going with transcription, um, it would take us to the end of this century in order to finish it. And so with Melissa and other colleagues, um, about um, seven or eight years ago, not quite ten years ago, but um, we established Transcribe Bentham as a crowdsourcing initiative, a scholarly crowdsourcing initiative where we asked volunteers to transcribe Bentham's manuscripts. This was also linked to digitisation of the Bentham papers, which allowed the uniting of the um, collections from the British Library and UCL in digital form. Um, with the, that, that was a collection separated at Bentham's um, death. So that's um, the first time that, that's been brought together since he died. And um, the, I think part of the success for Transcribe Bentham was that it was linked to the edition, that there was some um, further point to, to doing it, apart from simply transcribing the manuscripts. And also, before we set up Transcribe Bentham, we had a very um, well-constructed database of the Bentham papers, so we already had our metadata in place, up to 15 fields of information for each and every one of the um, 60 odd thousand folios in the UCL collection, and those folios turn into, I'd like say, about 100,000 pages. So our volunteers have now transcribed 19,000 pages um, using our um, crowdsourcing um, um, website. And those transcripts are now feeding into the editorial process as we take them forward to the, um, the critical edition. What I would like to see is a complete transcript produced so you can obviously see where the HTR would be most welcome in that instead of waiting for you know, 10, 15 years for a transcript, we might get it tomorrow, which is what, what we all want, though we all know that's rather unrealistic, but still. Um, and um, then as a starting point to improve the transcripts, so HDR generated transcripts might be put out to volunteers who could then correct them and um, then feed even better transcripts into our editorial process and therefore save time. And we can also, um, we've also started to use um, the um, OCR of um, facility on transcribers with um, excellent results. That's taking 19th century, late 18th, early 19th century printed editions and uh, very quickly putting them into the editorial template which we use to send them to the press. So what I would like to see um, developed is a, a workflow which starts with um, images going to HCR transcripts, crowdsource input, into an editorial process, 
and coming out at the other end um, text which, uh, or, uh, which is ready to be sent um, to the typesetter to be put into a critical edition but also making available a website where uh, a lot of the manuscripts we don't publish um, for various reasons because the main one being that they, what we are publishing are core human works and so there's a lot of additional manuscripts such as plans, notes, um, earlier drafts but which are still of interest to scholars um, and um, having those available uh, on, a, uh, on, a, on a web platform for people to search and to look at and also to look at the, we're really interested in looking at the critical edition and see how, you know, what we've done in the edition as um, compared to the raw, um, the, the, the starting point with, with the manuscript. So I think um, you know, what we have is a, um, a set of materials of um, great historical importance, of still of philosophical relevance, which are of great interest across a wide variety of disciplines. And um, so uh, the way uh, you know, making that more widely available will also feed into better scholarship. Thanks, Philip. Roger? John. My name is Laura Mann and I'm a mathematician at the University of Rostock and I guess uh, most of you are already fed up with my introduction because uh, what we are doing here has now been mentioned um, very often. Um, Trans uh, Krios and in the Read project um, uh, I'm leading the SITLAB team and the SITLAB team in Rostock produces uh, somehow at least one component for the ATR, for the text recognition and also for uh, line detection, for the decoding, for the keyword search. So we are a technology partner in the REIT project. And um, yeah, um, our own work with uh, Transcribus is quite different from what you, um, most of you are doing with Transcribus because uh, we are using it as a um, yeah, destination of our software in a sense, not using it like as users. Uh, but we are using it and um, this also gives me the opportunity for me to uh, mention it because uh, we ran into some discussions whether we would love to have application and testing via Transcribus and the answer clearly is yes because um, setting up a single project without Transcribus means a lot of overhead of work for, for us for instance to handle data and so on. And we are more than glad that Transcribus also takes that burden from us. So we would uh, love to have the workflow like we develop a new technology and you are using it via Transcribus and so using all this data transfer and image presentation and so on via Transcribus. Um, yeah, also we are using Transcribus for uh, ground truth of course, so the uh, data you are de delivering to Transcribus as far as we are allowed to do it of course uh, is more than welcome for testing new algorithms and so on because we are far from being able to produce uh, ground truth on our own. So this is really a very valuable uh, contribution and one of the areas which uh, Günther always uh, has in mind uh, or has in mind when he uh, speaks about the various um, uh, aspects of Transcribus. Yeah, where do I see Transcribus in five years? Um, uh, first of all, of all, I would uh, like to point out that still uh, I would love to have Transcribus uh, accompanied by re ongoing read projects. Maybe we have read two and read three, or I don't know what it is always called. So common read project, and it would be it would be great for us if we uh, were on the team on the board then uh, also. Uh, then something more as uh, the address see now as Philip, I guess I would love to see a transposition in Transcribus also. While we are now sticking with 1.3, I believe in five years we will stick with 3.1. And so that's probably uh, also an expectation uh, which sets a benchmark for uh, Philip and his uh, mates who, who do very valuable work for us in setting up uh, all this environment uh, for, for work. Yeah, but then, uh, apart from these things, I would love to see Transcribus also on top, um, um, yeah, at least in Europe, in the world, we'll see, um, um, in, uh, in the state-of-the-art state of technology for uh, automatic text recognition and everything which is somehow adjoined to that. Um, I would um, love to have it as an acknowledged and uh, appreciated, of course, data source for, for ground tools for the technology development, what I pointed out earlier, for many people, 
um, who are working in technology development in this area, having good ground truths is really a very tough question. Um, of course, I um, also see the different demands here in the audience. We had frequent discussions of that. That, for instance, um, scientific demands on having a virtual research environment. What is the basis of the ongoing read project um, application and EU call at that time was this destination. So it would be great if this virtual research environment for scientific purposes uh, is then well established and widely used. So this meets what um, Melissa said for. And also on the other hand, I see that there are completely different demands somehow from um, archives, libraries, so people who have uh, sort of mass digitization in mind and mass processing rather than having a maybe higher quality uh, but a smaller collection digitization. So I'm, I would really love to see Transcribos then having find its place um, in, in this wide range of demands uh, and having meeting the requirements of archives, libraries, like uh, public institutions and also what we already have and know from uh, commercial uh, usage also, uh, like big publishing houses and so on, uh, who also can use the uh, um, uh, technology, of course. So there's a wide range of different applications and somehow uh, I, I wish Transcript was uh, having the luck within the next five years to find a, a good place, a well-established place in all of these demands. Thanks, Roger. Um, I wonder if we can pick up on that last point about transcribers having multiple applications and users. So, are there any strategies or ideas we could have about how to balance this? We've got archives and libraries, we have computer scientists and maybe commercial use as well in the future. Um, how do we balance the needs of these different groups? So I, I think that we have to keep the, the core the core driver of the project, which is is helping academic researchers, right? So that was a core kind of element to it. And it would be a shame to lose that, but at the same time there is a hope that if I know the project well enough that it will be sustainable at some point on its own, which means there has to be a revenue stream. And this is always the balance with these digital projects, it is how you keep something ongoing, especially if the funding stops. So there has to be a balance, but within that, this isn't a startup like Google or Facebook, right? It is a, a product which was designed around a particular academic research task, and so we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that we have an, a community that are engaged with it, that we are hoping to open up historical manuscripts for people to do research on and yes there's a relationship with institutions and yes there might be a commercial relationship with other people and I'm sure that when people see some of, some of the bigger, I won't name them, but some of the bigger genealogy companies see the kind of successes which are, are coming out, this will be very attractive to them. Um, and there has to be a mechanism for balance to make sure that the original core community that this was built to serve can still be served in a way that we have the opportunities and the resources to do this kind of thing, as well as the resources to keep the machines up and running, to keep the people salaries being paid, and to keep the whole thing taking over. So it is about balance in the future. I think. Um, I I mean, as a historian, my sort of desiderata would be to have one place where everybody's transcripts were deposited. So I'm not reinventing the wheel, especially if it's an unfamiliar hand, or you know, what has everybody else done? And, and you know, we, we've all tended to be very private about uh, our, our work. And I mean, one of the great things about the Bentham Project is that anybody can have our transcripts because um, we're there to promote Bentham Scholarship. And maybe if there is a republic of scholarship, then that's what we should be aiming for. It's one place where we've done everything we've done, no matter how good or how bad, and let other people look at it and improve upon it. I mean, I used to think that the role of archives was to put things into neat order and stop people looking at them because it meant getting lots of shells and taking them out of order. And, I mean, fortunately, 
or a good thing is over the last few years things have completely changed and there is so much more emphasis now on making stuff available. So it seems to me that it may not be a balance of conflicting interests, but we've all got an interest in making what all this our 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 historical past available to whoever wants to um, to to look at it. And, and of course that's in the name of professional historians, but also that vast interest in people generally in, in understanding in understanding their past. And, and that's why we need an attractive um, web interface which is easy for people to use and to get into. I also like to say in um, the US, the idea of open source is really big. The only competition you have is private vendors to do the work for you or crowdsourcing transcription and going through a very lengthy process of developing yourself of how to do, if you want to do a critical edition or an academic edition, however you want to term it, um, is you have to set up a tool or a full process yourself or it's transcribist, it's it's not there yet, but it has the capability of getting there to have that entire process, like you're saying, from the start of digitization all the way through to publication. Um, that is what has been key in getting people interested so far in the conversations I've had, is that the fact that it's, it's open source, and I think um, institutions in the U.S. are very interested in if, if they can get grant funding or apply their own institutional funding to initiatives like that, they are very interested. How could we, at the moment, at sharing our resulting data sets that come out of all these individuals, do we have a central repository, a data repository that we're telling people to park stuff? They're on Zenodo, is that right? So you're using Zenodo? There, there is a central repository, but it's uh, just um, yeah, not available to everyone. So we haven't, yet, do not have currently the mechanism to ask people, can we share your data? Uh, so that's, that's on the to do list. Because that's part of the open source movement as well. Like the only thing that I mean, I guess we need to kind of show people the way in some ways. Like this is how we would do that, and using freely available things, whether it's GitHub or whether it's a Nodo, and whether it's parking documentation and information, and that people can take and reuse, so that we don't start reinventing the wheel and, and acting almost like these kind of open source vendors, but in a way which is friendly to our use community. And I know that there are issues with copyright and other issues with permissions and it gets complicated and people can be a bit guarded about what they're working on until they publish it themselves. But at some level, if we can provide the mechanisms or point to existing mechanisms that we can build on at a low cost, like some of will get up, that we could actually build some repositories quite easily if we just kind of get on with it. <laughs> I'm just sorry, I'm making more work for us. Okay. <laughs> Um, I wonder if anyone from the audience has got any questions or comments about this idea about what, how we should work with transcribers in the next five years, or how do you see it developing in the next five years? The impression I've got is that we haven't, we're going to, we're only starting to use it now, but the impression I'm taking away from the conference is that it works and it will be very successful. The issue I think is emerging is one of scalability, in that the amount of images and text that you're storing is still very, very small, but this will presumably balloon exponentially in a very short period of time, and so will the data processing requirements of the system. So I'm wondering what the plans are to make the platform itself scalable. That might be one for Gunter. <laughs> <laughs> you get another chair. So the, the plans for making it scalable are that actually we Concerning storage, um, that's not an issue. So 50 terabyte are reserved, 100 are applied. Um, more issue is uh, training resources. So the train models, that's something we have applied for two GPU servers. Um, uh, currently, and that, that maybe uh, gives me the chance to say that uh, last year we had uh, a downtime of, I think, 11 hours or 14 hours unexpected downtime for 2016. And today we had also an unexpected <laughs> <laughs> downtime. As you, as you probably experienced the last two or three hours, nothing was working. So your question is uh, really, uh, yes, correct. Um, <clears throat> yeah, um, 
the, the, the hardest bottleneck is currently to handle the, the ingest of the files. Uh, that's more a technical detail. Um, can can be resolved uh, by using more servers for, for for this. They are already available, so that's that's not the issue. Uh, on a larger scale, um, um, we know that we need to distribute uh, computing power and also storage. So uh, it makes sense uh, to to think on a central system, but with uh, distributed storage and distributed computing. So uh, I think that's a very, very important thing and would also fit very, very well to the whole structure in here. So there are many universities with excellent, excellent resources and it would make very much sense to uh, reuse or to use uh, small parts of these resources within, within the network. Yeah. So um, yeah, we, we are aware of that. I'm currently also we have this done today. I'm not I'm not worried I'm not worried now, but uh, it's it's correct. Um, things will uh, grow exponentially, hopefully, and then uh, it might become a problem. Are there any other questions or comments for the panel? I have a question. If this conference is all about the users. Um, so what do we think the priorities are for improving the user experience for a typical transcriber user? I was encouraged by the web interface, so the development of that would make life easier. We had our transcribers working directly in Transcribus, um, which is a bit of a learning curve for them, but as we weren't doing as that much markup or editorial work, um, once students got the hang of it, it went pretty quick. I think the other thing is just more of the tools built in. So like um, a text image, I think it's there. I don't know if I've requested it, but that process being able to just do that all on our own and kind of be queued up to know when that would be processed. Um, I'm trying to think. I think it's just more documentation, but I think with our project is we're, we have a philosophy of very much is open source, but also hopefully we'll get to the point of publishing as a publishing, but making it available on our transcription side, the work we're doing. So more either slideshows, videos, or just articles about this is the stuff we're testing, this is the steps we did to get there, and that, so that's, um, Basically, I've learned from so many other people, and I feel like that's the way to get back. Yeah, more behind the scenes. Yeah. Besides, yeah. Um, besides that, that's pretty what on my end. Yeah. 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 Anything else about the what's priority for improving the user experience? Of course, the the, the web interface. Which I mean, I think about it from a uh, you know, let's say a typical historian, if there is such a thing. You want to get access quickly to it. If you can get access quickly to a document instead of having to go, you know, go halfway around the world to a library which stores it, and then just have a, a simple way of getting the transcript and then exporting it into um, into a, um, a, 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 say a work document, and um, so and then being able to spot keyword spotting of a, a large group of manuscripts. That's what we do as historians. We read through loads of stuff and eventually find something we, 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 we want to um, to um, look at in, in more detail and so having that in a simple um, web interface is what's absolutely necessary and is what will be in my opinion the make or break of read because that's where the audience is and uh, from a uh, I think from a lot of people's perspective as well, having something where they can put their documents out for crowdsourcing or send them out to people with a particular expertise who might be willing to help. I mean, with, with our Bentham material, there's a certain amount of it in Russian. When we found somebody uh, who, was, who was interested in, in transcribing that, that, that material for us. And, um, so, you know, the creating those sorts of opportunities for people um, in a way that's easy to understand, easy to grasp, and it's intuitive. 
is, is really, I think, crucial to the, the success of this. And this links to funding because, uh, you know, if to get more money from the EU, um, you have to show how um, popular um, I think your, um, your system is. And, um, you know, the, the more people who are using it, then the more chance you have of getting funding. I would like just to, to emphasize what has been said before about explaining to the users what's going on. Um, one of the uh, things I learned uh, within the, these days, these two days, was that uh, there's more demand in uh, learning about what you say is uh, behind the scene. And so we were just ran into a, um, a tough discussion uh, about the meaning of the parameters, uh, interpretation, for instance. Uh, so it was a funny discussion, but it showed to me it's much more is necessary probably rather than having just a slider which carries a number or changes another uh, figure but what does it mean and what is the effect of all of it and uh, so it's the, we started thinking and discussing maybe behind the scene putting some more help even from the um, scientific part maybe the slides maybe also videos in a sense what happens or what shall I have uh, to think about or what do I have to do if something happens with the results, for instance, now in the keyword search, is it a good idea to um, sort of enlarge the parameter or make it smaller or whatever, because if we, uh, I guess if we leave the user helpless and it produces a lot of, um, well, bad user uh, interaction or bad user satisfaction emails to the, to the <laughs> platform, uh, to George, for instance, in this case, who the next morning will have the uh, the bad emails there. Um, yeah, uh, I guess even for us uh, technology people, it seems to be really necessary to put more behind uh, transcribers itself, which was now, for instance, part of the slides, of the talks, of the videos. Yeah. That's what I take home. Um, this might be one. Oh, sorry, go. On. This is really simple. But if an alert or email can go out when there's a new version to update, but many times you're using it and then all of a sudden something's not working right and then you just automatically, okay, I've learned, go check to make sure there's not an update. But. Yeah, you never know when we're going to update it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there's a question there. Just one thing sort of adding in some ways to, to what um, Roger was saying there, but, but more generally, it, it still seems that this is relatively experimental and people are playing around. And there's quite a lot of people, and I've spoken to people here, and, and, and somebody's tried this, and I thought, oh, that's interesting. Or and they can say, it works, it doesn't work, um, or you might want to experiment with this. And whether it's the technical side or it is the user side, there's a lot of knowledge in this room, which everyone being together for the past two days has been hugely helpful. But if there is a way to try and make that available within the interface, not necessarily sort of a, a little bit more, I guess, just, just make it more, more available and maybe create a, a network of users or places where people can share their experiences and their ideas. Um, because a lot of the time you do feel a little bit like you're on your own playing with something you really don't understand. Coming from a historical archive background, I have no idea what the technology is doing. So if it gives me a bad result, I don't know, is it me? Is it the, the technology? I, I think they, there's a lot of experience and, and knowledge that perhaps could be shared a little bit better. Okay. Something like a forum or something, would that be a good idea? Or even just an email list, transcriber users, email list, they can query these out and other people can pitch in and help. And, and to see, I don't know how much traffic that would be, but it's probably quite low traffic but very helpful. That's what you want, ideally, from an email forum. Um, it's worth trying, I mean. Yeah, so you'll be getting even more emails from me. <laughs> um, something you might be able to help with, Melissa. We've had a lot of success in Europe. Most people in the room are from Europe. Have you got any suggestions of ways we can promote the project outside Europe? Because you've got a lot of international connections. I always think it's best to show people. So um, and, and I'm thinking of kind of demonstrating to people like what they really want to do. Um, I'm very hooked into the the Russian digital humanities community. I don't care about it's a really long story over a beer. But um, I, I, I'm, just, I'm just back from Siberia a couple of weeks ago. 
again. Um, and they're digitising quite a lot of stuff over there too. So and there's issues about the cultural canon, and about the Western canon, and how much has been digitised, and how much we have to look forward to uh, making sure that mass digitisation happens not only in the usual places. Um, I don't know how well this would work on Cyrillic, and if there's any models that have been built already on Cyrillic. Yeah, we had the model this morning from the um, University Library of Belgrade. I can't remember the character error rate, but it's okay. It's okay, yeah. Um, so, it's always about finding the right people that you have to contact to, and um, it would be worth talking to there's a, a few core groups that are working. There's a group called GoDH, which is about um, internationalisation of digital humanities, and they are working specifically with people who are not Northern American, not European. So there is interest just now, uh, there's a big digitisation happening in Sudan of Arabic manuscripts. There is quite a lot of work happening in Namibia. There's quite a lot of work um, happening across Russia. There's a lots of interest in South America. And that's the type of user group or group of network of, of scholars who are using digital tools that could be ambassadors. Mm -hmm. And it's probably finding a way to do that. It might be worth them. Um, digital humanities, the, the big conference in can, kind of using computing and for hum humanistic research is going to be in Mexico next year. So it's uh, DH 2018 is, is in Mexico City, so it might be worth doing another workshop there. So there's going to be Red, Red HD is the Association for South American Digital Humanities and there will be a big representation from people from across South America. It might be worth running another workshop there. And I think it is about finding the ends and finding how you can... Um, so I can have a think about that and who we should be talking to, because I think some more workshops taking it showing people how it works. Um, National Library of Mexico are one of the, the people who are partnering with the, the DH conference next year, so that's the kind of people that we should be talking to about their archives. Yeah. I'm just ranting now like, yeah. as I think of things, but as there's, there's ways in that we could, we could um, get attached to various different international groups of people. And I think the digital humanities community is probably a good place to start because there are so many emerging groups of scholars that have already got networks established. Summer in Mexico sounds nice anyway. Um, <laughs> um, Roger, my understanding is that if we start expanding into new areas, um, for doing HTR, languages that don't have the Western alphabet is more, more difficult. So things like Arabic, Hebrew, Cyrillic text is more difficult to recognise. Is that true and can you speak a bit about that, different, using different alphabets? Yeah, that's certainly, um, let's say it's partially true. Uh, because from, from my core technological, uh, or te technological point of view or even mathematical point of view, um, it's arbitrary. Right? So we just have um, codes, uh, coding uh, character, let's say, or something, and uh, you all know about the, the notion of this uh, Unicode. Um, and uh, so what we restrict ourselves to is um, that we represent the characters by the Unicode code. And what the character really is, really is we don't care. And so every uni Unicode letter, for instance, carries also reading directions, or whether this is right to left or left to right, we don't care. So this is really not important. And if you have signs which are composed out of uh, various accents, let's say, or other parts of the letter, uh, then we map these things to a single character a code and work with it. But of course we are also aware of the practical component, and so um, I believe that if you have an alphabet uh, which is uh, composed of very different uh, letters, for instance, or very difficult letters, I can imagine that uh, the recognition procedure itself has trouble uh, to map the, um, the uh, image uh, finally to the, to the proper code. So I believe if the uh, writing style of the character is very tiny uh, sub-elements or so, it's probably harder to do. So it's um, um, sort of um, uh, ambiguity, um, the mathematical background is, uh, does not care about what the real meaning of the character is, but uh, we are aware that there are more difficulties than just the mathematical algorithm. 
So, uh, as usual, uh, the answer is neither clearly yes nor no, but somewhere <laughs> in between. There's a, again a slider. <laughs> Thanks. Are there any other questions or comments? Um, I want to ask you all what your favourite tool was from the tool pitch and why. Roger, your answer is obvious. <laughs> well, uh, we were, I mean, my group was, of course, uh, represented with the uh, keyword search and with the text image, and of course, I'm voting for the text image too, which was a very good one. <laughs> Handed us the list of tools. I would have to say that the text to image, um, and I'm sort of interested in the e learning app. Basically, for our project, a lot of the academics have been saying, okay, if you want to teach a student to do transcription, transcription and reading documents, coming up with something like that. So that might be really useful on that side. But I like text to image and um, layout analysis. <laughs> and for me it's keyword spotting because I think that would have the most transformational effect on the, the historical research that I've been involved in where you're just trying to find instances of something within a whole body of documentation and um, actually it's you're searching we can use this to search for the needle in the haystack right this is what this is all about at the end of the day if we have mass digitization, especially mass digitization of manuscript material, and we if we get this right, we can find the needle in the haystack quickly. That's going to change the volume and the level of queries and the time that you have to spend looking at original manuscripts. So for me, that is a, a win for the down the line to be able to speed up and historical research. I would say a, a word for the scan tent. <laughs> Which I guess because it's a, a thing, I really like it. And um, a week we had a, a student who was visiting the Bentham project from the Czech Republic with not uh, easy access to, to certain books. And there were a couple of books she particularly wanted to, to read and um, took her about an hour to do about 600 pages, just put the book in, turn the page, take it around and play and on and on and on. Um, it's, um, it's really, really great, great fun actually. And um, I think Louise and um, others are thinking about doing a, a scan tentathon, having a competition and seeing how many, how many pages of archive material you can do in a day. Yes, yeah, so you've got an idea because it's International Archives Day is on in June every year. So we have the idea that we're going to have a scanathon using the scan tent in three countries and see who can scan the most material in a day. After all, you know, we, if we can combine what we're doing with fun, then uh, Benton will be very pleased because that's a sort of head in his manifesto. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll bring the panel to a close shortly. Has anyone got any last questions or comments they want to make before we go? Okay, well, I would like to ask you to um, join me in thanking the panellists for um, speaking. Thank you very much. And stay where you are because we're going to hear from Guntu, who's going to do an announcement and close the conference. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you also for this uh, great discussion and... Uh, I think uh, once again, uh, thank you for coming and also an invitation for the second uh, Transcribus User Day in a year or so. We will organize it by sure. I hope to see you again. I don't know if it will be here, probably somewhere else, maybe in the mountains. Let's see. <laughs> uh, and um, yeah, I think um, it was really a great uh, confirmation of the that we are some, somewhere going in a direction which is appreciated by you and uh, this gives us, of course, a big motivation to go on. We know, of course, that um, a lot of things, a lot of requirements are there, but um, 
on the other hand, we have the feeling that many requirements are similar and, and we get a good picture of, of what is really necessary and what, is, um, what would help you in your work. I, I like very much uh, the open atmosphere, also doing all these test projects with you. Um, don't be too uh, impatient with us. Sometimes it takes a while that we are answering the emails. Um, yeah, but uh, I, I hope that uh, you understand this. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to see you again. Thanks for coming.